Okay, hello everyone. Let's get started again. Hello. Hi, so I'm happy to introduce uh, Ian. Uh, I haven't met Ian before, so I'm going to tell you things from his uh, profile page on the PyCon website. So if you want to get chair speakers or ch session chairs to say anything you want, that's a good place to put a load of rubbish. So, but hopefully Ian's not led me astray. So he's a local, he's a developer on MariaDB. He mentions uh, he works particularly on documentation. And his profile mentioned a lot of things like Perl and PHP and SQL. So hopefully we'll see that we've converted him to the light. Uh, thanks, take it away, Ian. Are we getting sound now? Good. Okay, yes, I do confess to having a, a poor background. So welcome, uh, I'm from the MariaDB Foundation. We're gonna be talking about MariaDB 10.2 and 10.3, some of the new features in there that are of interest to DBAs, but also to developers, some of the things you can take advantage in your, in your code. Um, so I'm sure everybody knows what MariaDB is. It's a fork of MySQL, the relational database. It was forked um, when the original developers of MySQL, uh, of MySQL became concerned about the future of that and whether it would still remain open source in, in practice as well as in principle. So they forked it to make sure that that would continue to be the case. And that's basically a drop-in replacement um, in almost all situations for, for MySQL. So there's the MariaDB Foundation and the MariaDB Corporation. I'm from the foundation. There's the corporation is the for-profit entity. They sell services and they sell uh, proprietary software as well that are added onto the core server. And the foundation exists to make sure that the community can continue to contribute to MariaDB so that um, any, yeah, any contributions that people want to make uh, are eased through the process, are welcomed, and are ensured that they're going to see the light of day. A bit out of sync here, jumping down. Okay, I know the talk said MariaDB 10.2 and 10.3, but talking to a few people, I realized not too many people know about some of the features in 10.1, so I thought I'd take a step back and go with some of the new features in 10.1 first. 10.1 is the previous stable release. Uh, it's in Debian 9, for example, at the moment. So probably if you're just relying on something on your distro, you are more likely to be using 10.1. So it first came out as stable in October 2015. Some of the new features it had, it's got the Galera cluster. So Galera cluster is basically a clustering engine. In MySQL, there's um, uh, an enterprise add-on. This is now a core part of MariaDB. Before MariaDB 10, it was a separate download. It was always freely available, but now it's part of the core server. So if you just download regular vanilla MariaDB, Galera is ready to go um, as soon as you, you, you need it. Encryption. This is data at rest encryption, so we're not talking about um, SSL or something like that across the network. We're talking about the data as it sits on your drive, um, in your log files. So that's now a possibility to implement from MariaDB 10.1 as well. Um, there's new kinds of page compression, roles, um, GIS improvements. I won't go into those too much too much detail, I'll just highlight them and leave it there. So MariaDB 10.2, that's the current stable release that came out in May this year. A um, couple of new features there. One of them is the storage engine called MyRox. And MyRox, so if you know the way MariaDB is set up, it has the concept of storage engines. The default storage engine is inodb, um, which is your regular multi-purpose storage engine, but you can get particular storage engines for certain purposes. And MyRox is one that was developed by Facebook. Um, obviously, their needs are quite intense, and they managed to push inodb to the extreme, 
But at some point, the space requirements become a, a difficulty, and Myrox is developed as a storage engine to allow greater compression. And that's now currently in alpha, but it's now part of MariaDB uh, from 10.2 as well. Flashback's a great feature. Uh, one of my first paid for projects that I ever developed was a booking system. So there I was writing my booking system. I rolled it out to the office. Everybody started doing their bookings for the rest of the year. And by the end of the day, all the data had been wiped out. Everybody's bookings had been lost. And my brilliant system had decided to use the timestamp. So if the timestamp was more than a certain period of time ahead, it would wipe out the old bookings. Of course, somebody's uh, uh, computer had the wrong timestamp and all the bookings were lost. So it was a good lesson in how not to go about rolling out a, a new development. But Flashback allows you to go back to a previous instant of the database. So you run some um, deletes or some updates that go wrong, you realize it's a complete mess, you can use the Flashback feature to use the binary log to roll back to a previous instance of the database. So it would have saved my bacon if it was around in those days. Uh, it only applies at the moment to, um, to DML, so deletes and updates, not to things like uh, changing the table structure, dropping the database entirely, or things like that. So window functions, and I'm going to go into that in another, another slide as well, and common table expressions. So the, the main focus in 10.2 was looking at standards compliance and adding missing functionality really. So window functions and common table expressions have been around in the SQL standard for quite a long time and were not yet in MariaDB. So they finally saw the light of day in 10.2. JSON and GeoJSON. And then this is more behind the scenes change, but without knowing it, if you were using MariaDB up until 10.1, you actually weren't using the InnoDB storage engine, you were using ExtraDB, which was a performance enhanced fork written by Pocona. Um, so a lot of the early benchmarks that people saw, the performance benefits that people saw from switching to MariaDB were actually because of ExtraDB. Um, but Oracle has now merged most of those improvements back into InnoDB, so it's caught up again, and there's not really much point to continue doing multiple merges, it just slows the developers down. So we've made the decision to go back to InnoDB, and to all intents and purposes, the performance is now equivalent, so there's no, no loss there. There's, this, there's a very obscure edge case where ExtraDB is still better, but I doubt anybody is going to come across it in practice. So window functions. Window functions are basically a function that can uh, do their work on a number of related rows. So if you take a normal function in the SQL statement, it works on that particular row. Or you can take an aggregate function that works on the entire, um, entire data set. So a window function is kind of somewhere in between. So if you know SQL, these are a list of aggregate functions that also work as window functions. Count, sum, average, and so on. So here's an example. We have a basic, is it all appearing? Not quite. Okay. Um, so we have a basic table with a number of students, a number of tests, there's two tests, SQL and tuning, and a number of scores. So you can run a query, select test, average score from the student, grouping by the test, so you can get the average for the test. So that's a fairly basic query that I'm sure if you're familiar with SQL, you probably use that kind of thing often, and that works well. The next query is a is the kind of query that people who are learning SQL tend to do and get results that they're not expecting. So if you want to get all of the students' results individually, as well as the average scores, in the same query, you might try something like the query at the bottom there, and you can see you only get 
a single student's results returned. You're not getting what you probably were hoping for. Um, and that just doesn't work in regular SQL without window functions. Either you would have to use multiple queries, or you would have to pull the data set into the code and then do some of that calculation inside the code. So window functions allow you to now pass all that work across to the database layer. So it makes your life as a developer a little bit easier. You hand it to the database and don't worry too much about taking care of what it can't do. So there's an example of a window function. Um, it's highlighted by the, the over keyword and partitioned by. So in this first case, you're partitioning by the test. So you're getting the average for each test, for the SQL test and for the tuning test. But at the same time, you're getting all of the individual students' results back. So that's the kind of query that's possible with a window function that wouldn't have been possible uh, before. And the second example just shows you partitioning by, by name instead of by test. So you can get the average for each individual student. Chun is getting 74 and Espen is struggling a bit with, with 37. So that was an aggregate function. There's also a couple of new functions that are just useful as window functions. So they, they listed here. And I'll show you a quick example of that. Create another sample table. And a common use case is to try and order the results that you get back and to get row numbers for each result. So the, the three functions I'll show you in this example are rank, dense rank, and row number. So um, if you look at the query, select, select rank over partition by course. So course is what you're grouping by and then you're applying either the rank, the dense rank, or the row number function. So this just shows you the difference between the three. If you look at the row number function for biology, row number one is Roger's result, row number two is Bilal's, and then for maths, you get one, two, three, four. So it's basically giving you a row number back, which can be quite useful. And it means it's another thing that you don't need to have to worry about in the code. You can just pass it as a function to the database. Uh, rank and dense rank are similar functions. Um, if you look at rank, it gives you the same results for biology, but for maths, um, both Tulile and Prite both have a score of 60, so they both have the same rank, a rank of 2, as you can see in the left column there. And then it jumps to 4 for Chun, who got 55. And Dense rank is almost the same, except that it doesn't have that gap between the two, so it jumps from two to three rather than two to four. And so that was very briefly window functions. Common table expressions. Um, common table expressions are similar to a derived table, or they're similar to a view that you can access inside the same query. And they're very useful for things like recursion. SQL is very poor at traversing tree structures. Doesn't do that well at all. Common table expressions, or recursive common table expressions, allow you to traverse a tree structure, like a, a root map, very easily. It's a structure that, that handles that kind of thing really well. So if you take this example, you've got a couple of bus routes from New York. You can get to Washington, or you can get to Boston. And from Washington, you can get to Raleigh. And from Washington, you can also get to Boston, and Boston back to New York. Okay, that will be a query that allows you to show the possible destinations from that. Um, and the keyword there is with. With tells you that you're getting a common table expression. In this case, it's a recursive common table expression. You also get non-recursive common table expressions. And then, you can see it's given the name, bus destination, bus DST, and that's, that's get used later on in the query. So that's why I say it's like a view that you define that you then use later on in the same query. So effectively, it returns um, uh, Boston and Washington in the first pass, and then recursively goes back and finds the next part along the route. So that's basically where it gets its name from. 
So it's a useful, a useful kind of structure. Yeah, this is another example which shows you the entire path, not just the destination. Um, so New York, New York, Boston, New York, Washington, New York, Washington, Boston, and New York, Washington, Rally. Uh, I won't go and try and explain that too much. But again, the principle is similar, that the kind of thing that you previously would have had to do in your code, now you can hand across to the database layer and get the results immediately from your query, um, which is usually a much more efficient way of doing it. MariaDB 10.3, that's the current development release. Um, it was first, that's the first alpha came out in April this year. And the focus there has been on Oracle compatibility, um, or compatibility with other databases in general. MariaDB Corporation is getting quite a lot of, getting quite a lot of uh, banking customers who are trying to migrate to MariaDB, and they are asking for compatibility with other databases to make it easier to migrate, and that's really been the main focus of the work that's being done with MariaDB 10.3. Um, so things like sequences. Uh, sequence is a, uh, it's a kind of a replacement for auto-increment, if you've used that kind of thing, um, as well as intersect and accept, and I'll show you examples of that now. The idle transaction control, that's an example from one of our contributors, which is Alibaba. Alibaba is the Chinese e-commerce giant. Um, up until this year, the foundation had one Platinum sponsor, which was Booking.com. Uh, from this year, we've got two more, which is Tencent and Alibaba, the two Chinese giants. And the reason they got involved with MariaDB is they tried, they actually forked MySQL a long time ago. And they, they have more than 100,000 database instances running at any point in time. So the kind of scale that they're working at is, is quite phenomenal. So they're coming up against problems that only a handful of other companies in the world are, are encountering, the kind of scaling issues. So they forked MySQL and added the enhancements to it, but then they found that they were falling behind as MySQL and MariaDB developed. So they thought, well, let's actually use open source the way it's supposed to be used, contribute our changes back so that everybody benefits, and then we can also benefit from the changes that are, are coming out in the new releases. So they tried to do this with um, MySQL, and their changes weren't accepted. So they came to MariaDB, and we were quite happy to accept their changes. And these are now going into 10.3. So idle transaction control doesn't sound that exciting, but it's normally a connection times out if it doesn't do anything for a long period of time. Um, this gives you more fine-tuned control over that, so you can time out a connection um, based upon what kind of transaction it is. Is it a, a read transaction? Is it a write transaction? And you can, you, you can bring that kind of timeout to a much smaller, much smaller number rather than the generic timeout. So for most use cases, it's not going to make any difference. But if you're running on Alibaba kind of scale, it's an important part of their, of their requirements. So this page shows you the difference between um, union, accept, and intercept. So union has been around for a long time. Uh, accept and intercept were two new um, additions to the, to the syntax in 10.3. So union, if you take a query, so you've got a, a data set of one to six, just as an example, and your left query selects everything less than or equal to three, and your right query, everything greater than or equal to three, a union is going to bring everything together. So that's the definition of union. Without the all keyword, um, they know duplicates. So that brings it all together. Except returns everything that's in the left side of the query, but not in the right side of the query. So one and two. Three is, is um, returned by both, so it's excluded and four, five, six is in the right query, so that's excluded. Um, and intersect brings only the results that are on both the left and the right side of the query, so in this case, three. 
So they've been part of the SQL standard for a long time. They've just never been implemented in MariaDB. Mm, that gives you a quick example of a sequence, which I said is a kind of replacement for auto increment. Um, you can create a sequence that's basically stored in the database as a table. You can start up with any number you want, set your increment, and then using the next val function, you push the, push the sequence along, or the last val function to return the previous value. And like an auto increment, you can also reset it at any point. Um, it's got some advantages over auto increment. So if you are developing applications and you're relying on auto increment, you might want to consider moving to sequences with your, with your new development. Um, it handles sort of multiple connection issues a little bit better than, than auto increment did. And that's basically it. Um, that's where you can find us, in documentation and IRC. Yeah, any questions? Right, thank you, Ian. Uh, you've finished uh, very early, so we've got plenty of time for questions. Uh, do we have a second microphone somewhere? Um, I just have a question on the window functions that you mentioned, um, specifically the grouping and the aggregating, that sort of thing. How performant is using MariaDB versus the conventional techniques that would be used to achieve grouping and aggregating? It would usually be faster. So the, the, the advantage of bringing it to the database layer is, is you can get a performance benefit out of that. Okay. So you should test, obviously, the situation and your indexing, but on the whole, if it's done well, it should be an improvement in performance. Um, an improvement maybe um, as fast or faster than something like Elasticsearch or some other alternative? Elasticsearch is a very specific use case. So I think in, in that kind of case, it's, it's optimized for that particular use case. Um, but as a general uh, kind of general performance benefit, then window functions generally are better than bringing it across into the code. Without having to write the SQL, well, that's the idea with most applications is they take that layer away from you, kind of create a layer of abstraction. Um, I guess I like to, to get involved in it myself and, and do the direct queries, but I know a lot of developers um, prefer to be a little bit more remote from that. So, uh, With your JSON support that you were mentioning was introduced in 10.1, do you have native querying on that, or is it just optimized storage for JSON? The, JS, the JSON type is implemented slightly differently to MySQL. So in MySQL, it's actually a separate type, specific JSON type. The MariaDB implementation is basically as a, a text, um, which matches the SQL standard. So the MySQL implementation doesn't match the standard. Um, which is why MariaDB did it this way. Uh, and in performance, it seems that doing it 
in text seems equivalent, so there's no real difference to it. Uh, one of the issues is that you're not constrained in the same way. So if you want to add, uh, if you want to add a constraint, you either manually add a constraint to the structure, which then has a performance impact, or you allow a little bit more flexibility and allow people to put data in which isn't actually JSON into the JSON type, which can, things can go a bit haywire that way. Um, so there's a bit of a debate going on about whether to, to apply the constraint as part of the type or whether to just leave it as a kind of text and, uh, and let people make their own mistakes. <laughs> there's a kind of philosophical debate there. Which, wh which do you prefer? <laughs> I'm going to be greedy and ask a second question. <laughs> the microphone. Uh, when do you expect 10.3 to be stable? You mentioned 10.2 is the current stable release. Well, the classic open source answer is when it's ready, right? But uh, I'll try and give you more, more than that. I mean, we're in our second beta at the moment. Um, so it's possible the next release, I mean, second alpha, sorry. It's possible the next release will be a beta or it might be another alpha. And then, so I can say maybe four more releases. So perhaps four, five, six months kind of time, that sort of time frame. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, right there. Okay, I don't know if the background in Mariah will leave you all with MySQL, but in terms of the sequences, is that global sequence or is the can you assign a sequence per table? Uh, it's by table. Okay, uh, anyone else? Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Ian. It was a very interesting talk. Um, are you MariaDB CTEs nested? Are uh, MariaDB? The CTEs, the common table expressions, are they nested? Can you nest them within one another? I can't answer that for sure. I'm not actually sure about that. Um, yeah. I don't know. Okay. If, if it's not, and it's really convinced the developers to do that, I'm recently using another open source database where you can do nested CTEs, and it's a whole lot of fun. Is that PostgreSQL? OK. I'll look into that. Um, the thing with, with common table expressions is they're often implemented differently across different databases. They've been as part of the standard since 2006, probably. Um, but basically, every database has slightly different implementation. They implement it partially. There's almost none, in fact, there are none that implement the entire standard. Um, so when you're moving from one database to another, you need to investigate how the CTEs work in that particular uh, version of it. Okay. I'll ask a question about CTEs, and I noticed that the curse of CTE, for example, like there was a bit of code in there which made sure when you found the pop, it didn't go back through. Quite easy to go and hose your database by clicking infinite recursion? No, because by default there's a setting that um, has a limit on that, so it will time out eventually. You can uh, set it to be infinite if you want to, really have the opportunity to hose your database, but by default you can't. So there's a bit of protection. Yeah, sounds like Python short size recursion. Uh, more questions? But it's a quick announcement. The just a reminder: the lightning talks are happening after the tea break. Uh, sorry, no, they're after yeah. coffee break. <laughs> happening. Yeah, so there's a coffee break. Then there's some sessions, and their lightning talks are right at the end of the day, and they're in the conga room. If you and before the lightning talks themselves, there is a 50-minute setup time. So if you're giving a lightning talk, uh, please just go to the conga room at quarter past four to set up, and that will conflict with some of the other talks that are happening. Okay, is anyone else sort of a question in the meantime? No, again, let's thank our speaker, and then we can get tea.